We come, Justin's exactly right. We come to him just as we are, and it's he that cleans us up. Hey, we're going to be looking a little bit at, at that this morning. Uh, interesting, but we are. John chapter 8. John chapter 8 this morning. I'm going to turn to John 8. Read along with me in John chapter 8 this morning, and this is what it says. We'll read the first 11 verses. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. It says, a crowd soon gathered and he sat down and he taught them. As he was speaking, or as he was teaching, teachers of the religious law, the scribes and Pharisees, brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. They had set her in the midst. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman is caught in the act of adultery. They said, Master, this woman was called in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? They're trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus simply stoops down or bends down. He writes in the dust with his finger. He did this as though they heard, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the eldest or the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Christ, in verse 1, is the Mount of Olives. He returns to the Mount of Olives. But he's back early the next morning. He's back again teaching at the temple. The master teacher. The master teacher is back teaching. No one can teach like the master can. He teaches with such accuracy. He teaches like none other. He teaches with such precision. And he's back at it doing it again. And when he taught, a crowd would understandably come around him to listen to his, his wisdom, to listen to his insight, to listen to his precision of Scripture. It says a crowd soon gathered and he sat down and he, he taught them. He, he took every opportunity that presented itself. To teach the people. To teach them of the glory of His Father. To teach them of the glory of who He is. The redemptive plan. To teach them that redemption only comes through the Son. To teach them salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. He did the will of his father perfectly. The crowd is gathered. He sits down and he, he teaches them. 
Nothing new, is it? Nothing new when it comes to Christ. It's what he done. He done it effectively, of course. He taught. But this is a different day. And no doubt, not only would he draw with his teaching those that were interested in what he had to say, but he would draw with his teaching those that had no interest in what he had to say in a sense, but longed to, to tear down what he said, longed to do away with what he said. They couldn't stand what he was saying. And we see something similar to that here in verse 3. As he's speaking, as he's teaching, scribes and Pharisees bring unto him a woman, a woman that is taken in adultery. And they set her in the midst. Now imagine the scene, place yourself there. He's teaching in the temple, he's got a crowd, a crowd is gathered, and on shows the scribes and the Pharisees. The religious what? Police. The religious police have showed up. The religious police show up in John 8 and, and they take this woman that they've brought and they say, we've caught her in the act of adultery. If you look into this story deeper, you find that this is probably a setup. Probably a setup by these religious police, scribes and Pharisees. Probably a set up by them, a sense of they knew that they can bring somebody along with them and have him with her in this adulterous affair, this adulterous act, catch them in the act, no doubt, and now place her in front of Jesus. To create sort of a dilemma for him. You see at this time. Listen at, at, at this time. Okay. Rarely could adultery be proven. Still hard to prove today. Because at this time. Two or more witnesses had to witness the actual act. They had to be there. And they had to witness it. The actual act itself, it just wasn't enough at this day and time if you look at the history back then to, to walk out of the door with, with a woman or a man and somebody else, two people say, ah, oh, they're in this room and, and they're into a, an, an, an adulterous affair, no doubt. No, that wasn't enough. They're, they had to actually witness it. They had to actually witness the act going on by two or more. There's no doubt here that would play into this. So this is starting to set up as a, starting to, the pieces are come together, are coming together as a, as a set up by these Pharisees and these scribes so they can bring this woman before Jesus and say, oh, what are you going to do with her? If you notice in this whole situation, they bring the woman, but where's the guy, right? Where's the man in this deal? He too should be brought before Jesus, but he's not there. They only bring the woman. They got their witnesses, if you will. This is a plan put together not only to embarrass Jesus, but to embarrass the woman, to bring them to bring the woman before the crowd, to bring her before Jesus, before this crowd of people at the temple, to raise this big scene, anything they can come up with to what? 
to discount the Lord Jesus. To discount His authority. Discount who He is. To discount who He says He is. Whatever it takes in their minds, whatever they can come up with, whatever they can come up with to discount the Messiah. It says in, in verse 4, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act was taken in the very act. Like I said just a minute ago in John chapter 8, where's, where's the man? Where's the, where's the man that also partook in this, in this very act of adultery? He's nowhere to be found. He's nowhere to be seen. This is all a plan by the scribes and Pharisees to do what they can do to overthrow the Redeemer of the world. So back here in John chapter 8 verse 4 this woman's caught in the act of adultery. This no doubt has, this no doubt has, has stopped what Jesus was teaching on. Now all the attention goes where? In John chapter 8. Where's all the attention going? All the attention is going to find its way to who? All the attention is going to find its way to this woman. This adulterous woman. The attention now goes from, from Jesus to this adulterous woman in and these scribes and these Pharisees, the religious police, the focus is this. As they drag this woman in and probably barely clothed. They're going to make a scene, aren't they? They're going to make a scene. We caught her in the very act in John chapter 8, verse 1 through 4. We caught her in the very act of adultery. And what they did is they've, they've, they've concocted this up. It's a plan. And it's not so much to convict the lady who's in the act of adultery. This whole plan is to is to is to is to come up with something to go against Christ. To get Him to contradict Himself. To get Him to contradict Himself and what He's been teaching. What He has said. And this is it in verse 4. Listen to what it says in verse 4. He said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Verse 5, the law of Moses says, Now Moses in the law commands us that such should be stoned. Hey, we caught her in the very act, right? We've got the witnesses. It's like we said a few minutes ago. We've got the witnesses to convict her. Like I said, I mean, to, to, to convict on adultery is, is, is such a rare deal. Especially then, like it is today, because it's such a private act. We you said five, ten minutes ago, you got to have at least two witnesses back in then. And then they, according to law, you got to have two, two or more witnesses. So this is so rare. This is extremely rare, rare that, that, that somebody would actually be stoned for adultery at this day and time. Because it was just so hard to prove. It's not hard to prove when you concoct it, when you, when you make when you put this together when this is a plan when you got your people there to actually witness it's not hard to prove the law of Moses says to stone her now listen to what it says in verse 5 
What do you say? That's, that's it right there. That's what this whole plan is. What do you say, Jesus? Where do you say we go with this? What do you say we do about this? Law of Moses says we should stone her for adultery. What do you say? What do you say to this act of adultery that we see being committed here? What's your response, Lord? What's your response? What's your response to this act? Give us, give us your answer. You see, in their minds, they've come up with a trap. In their minds, they have Jesus now. They got him right where they want him. In their minds. You see, if Jesus stops and says, Stone her. Stone her. Then they'll say, well, for such a long time you've been preaching forgiveness and peace and reconciliation. But now you say stone her. So all that talk of forgiveness is for naught. And if he says... Let her go. And he goes against the law of Moses, which calls for stoning in the act of adultery. Interesting thing about this is at this day and time, they can bring up the law of Moses all they want, but the final authority at this day and time was turned over to the Romans. They had the final, they had the final call of corporal punishment. They had the final call on on, on stoning. The scribes and Pharisees are all over the place, but they think they got him pinned in a corner. If he says stone her, then that goes against all his forgiveness that he's been preaching on in their minds. If he says let her go, then he goes against the law of Moses that he's talked about. We got him, right? We got him. We got, the, we got Jesus right where we want him. And it's the same, sort of the same thing today in the world in which you live. If you set out and try to serve Christ and try to be an example in this lost and dying world, your peers around, those around you, a lot of times, if they're lost, a lot of times they will come up with dilemmas for you. They will come up and try to pin you in a corner, right? You ever been there? You ever been there? But it seems like they've come up with a plan. And, and they're going to ask you that question that you've never heard before about the Bible or about Jesus. They're going to throw you a curveball. I'm going to throw you a pitch you've never seen. And man, they've waited for this opportunity. And, and now they've got you. And hey, they might throw something at you where you don't really have the best answer for. That's how humanity is, isn't it? That's how lost humanity is with Christians. Anything to, to trip them up. Hey, you can throw me a curveball all day long and I might swing and miss. But you're not throwing Christ a curveball. I can assure you of that. You're not backing Him into a corner to where He has no answer. To where He has no response. To where He has nothing to say to your accusation your concocted story, your concocted act that you've put together. You're not doing it to Him. You might do it to me. Some might do it to you. 
but not to Christ. The response in verse 5 is, What sayest thou, you? Like I said before, you've heard it said to yourself, if you truly live out the Christian life in, in your everyday life, and then you're around a bunch of, a, a, lot of old, uh, a lot of unbelievers, this will come up. But what do you say about this of Scripture? What do you say about that of the Bible? What do you say about this of Jesus? These things do come up. And, it's, and, and it was no different in these days. And here you see it, this question being presented to Jesus. What do you say we do with them? As they said it and kind of smirked and stood back on their heels probably and we got him now. We've put the plan together. and we execute, We're executing it oh so well. Verse 6. This they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him. Or this they were trying to what? Trap him. Trap him, right? It's a plan. Trap him. If we can just trap him, we can trap him into saying something that we can use against him, right? We can, we can get him in a predicament to where if he says something, and we can say, ah, there you go, there you go, you broke the law of Moses. Oh, there you go, teacher of forgiveness. Uh, where's the forgiveness now? Maybe we can get him pushed in the corner. And trap him. Getting to say something that we can use against him. And hey, we might not even use it against him now, but but we might we might bring it up down the road. And you've been there? You've been there before? You say things and it's brought up down the road against you. Whatever the situation may be. What's his response? What's the master teacher's response? What response does he have in verse 6? Most humanity responds verbally, don't they? Huh? I mean, we just come back. I mean, those that are good at arguing, you ever been around believers that are good at arguing? I mean, they just come back. I mean, they come right back. I mean, you got something, bam, they're right back at you. Or might not even be a believer, you just got master arguers. Those that can argue, those that can argue, argue with a argue with a tree. I mean, they're just that good. I mean, you walk away from them because you're just like, Jesus, no need talking to this guy, this gal, they're just too much. And even when you walk away, they're still speaking. Amen. They don't stop. Jesus' response was this. He stoops down, it says in verse 6. Jesus stooped down, and with his finger he writes or wrote on the ground. A little section in the King James Version, it says, As though he heard them not. That was added to the KJV. Um, the other translations, of course, are, are different, but the King James Verse adds, adds this little section as though he heard them not. But uh, that's there. But regardless, he stoops down and with his finger he, he writes on the ground. An interesting point, interesting thing right here. There's never another sp spot in Scripture where... Jesus, it says Jesus actually physically wrote. This is pretty much it. Interesting. Jesus stoops down and with his finger he, he writes on the ground as maybe he didn't act as if he heard them not or maybe he didn't really pay attention to what they had to say. So he writes on the ground. 
What's he writing? What's he writing on the ground? Place yourself in the scene. Remember the scene. Bear with me. Stay with me. Remember the scene. Jesus is teaching. Teaching at the temple. Sitting and teaching. The crowd is around. He's teaching for a while. The master teacher. Scribes and Pharisees, the religious police, show up. They concocted this act with this woman. They probably, she's probably barely clothed. They show up. They throw her in front of all the people. She's caught in the act of adultery with a man. They don't drag him. Who knows? He might even been part of them. Who knows? What are you going to do with her? Trying to trap him. What's your answer, Jesus? Give us an answer. So there she stands. She's a spectacle in this whole thing. She can't believe what's going on. All she knows is they're talking about killing her. And Jesus says nothing but stoops down and with his finger he writes on the ground. He's silent. He's silent. Some of us sometimes can, can benefit by learning to be silent. Sometimes it's just a good thing to be silent. Sometimes when people say something to you in regards to Christ, in regards to Christ's scripture, sometimes it's okay to be silent. Sometimes you're just called to be silent. Not all the time, but sometimes. He stoops down and he writes on the ground. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them. Now here's the great dilemma. Here's the great speculation of Scripture. One of the great speculations, great dilemma, great discussions is this. Is what in the world did he write on the ground? Have you ever heard that before? Huh? You ever heard that debate? been in church for any amount of time you've heard that talked about in the past what did he write on the ground what was he writing we don't know we can speculate a lot of people you know, speculate he was some are speculating he's writing talking about the law of Moses others speculate talking about forgiveness and whatever and some say which I can see this was he writing the sins of those around him was he writing the sins of the scribes and Pharisees that were with him? Did he bend over and write down their sin? After all, he would have knew their sin, right? I get that. I understand that. We get that. We understand that. But regardless of what he was writing, whatever it was, whatever it was, it what? It sparked their attention. It was penetrating. So when they continued asking him, he lifts up himself and says unto them. Now can you imagine this scene? They kept demanding an answer. So he stands up again. And he says, okay, You, he, that is without sin among you, let him be the first to cast the stone. Let him be the first to throw the stone. Can you imagine a penetrating stare? As he looked into the eyes of the accusers. As he looked into the eyes of the scribes as he looked into the eyes of the Pharisees. You, you who are without sin, whatever one is without sin, whatever one is without sin standing right here, right now, whoever, not just the scribes, not just the Pharisees, 
But all those people standing, all those people looking, all those people that were there present that day, whoever is there without sin, you throw the first stone. You throw the first stone. Think about it. Think about this. Think about this. There's a great crowd listening, watching. Were they without sin? No, they had sin, right? The scribes, were they without sin? The Pharisees, were they without sin? No, they had their baggage right behind them like everybody else. Who was there without sin? Who was there? Who was standing there without sin? And who was standing there without sin that could have threw the first stone? Who would it have been? Christ Himself. Christ Himself. Did you ever think about that? Of all those standing there, He poses the question, you without sin, throw the first stone. Nobody's without sin, but who? Him! And again he stoops down and he writes on the ground. This is an amazing story. Again he stoops down in verse 8 and he, and he writes on the ground again. He writes on the ground. Bends over. He writes on the ground once again. <clears throat> and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even until the last. If there is anything good in that passage of Scripture there in verse 9... At least they still had a conscience, right? Huh? Amen. At least their conscience wasn't seared. At least their conscience wasn't to the point to where they were not convicted. At least they were convicted of their sin. They go out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even into the last. The conviction of sin has set in to the scribes and to the Pharisees. Even unto the last. The conviction of sin is in them. Not to such a point to where they come to faith, but they've just their sin has been on display. Their sin is now a billboard, right? And they're convicted about their own sinfulness. What was it that was wrote on the ground? I don't know. It might have been the sins of them. What was it? We'll never truly know. But whatever it was, man, did it convict them. Jesus is left alone. He's left alone and the woman is standing in the mist. The accusers. The accusers have left one by one. They slipped away one by one. To only the humble one. Jesus the Christ the Messiah standing in the middle of a crowd with the woman. Can you imagine what the crowd is thinking right now? I mean, can you imagine what they're thinking? It's an amazing sequence of events. Jesus stands. Again, 
And he says to the woman, as he lifted up himself, he saw none but the woman and said unto her, Woman, where are your accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? He stands up and he says to the woman, Where's your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? She's shocked. She's shocked at the sequence of events. No, Lord, she says. No, Lord. Verse 11. No man, Lord. And Jesus responds, says unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Neither do I condemn thee. Turn to John chapter 3, verse 17. John chapter 3, verse 17 says this. For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the Holy One begotten of God. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth on him for redemption is not condemned. But he that believeth not on him is condemned already. Because he doesn't believe in the name of the Holy One, the only begotten Son of God, the Lord Jesus. Jesus turns to her and he says, I, I, I don't condemn you. She comes to an understanding of who is standing before her. Christ the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world. You see, when you, especially in church, when a believer is, finds himself or herself falling in sin or in a sin, it's not that we as believers should come along them and beat them up, if you will, with their sin. But we should come along them with tears in our eyes, aching in our souls. Because we long to see them freed from what? Their sin, right? Their sin that has a hold of them as a believer or the sin that has a hold of an unbeliever. Whatever the situation may be. Remember Paul in Romans chapter 7? We talk about it from time to time. His longing. His longing to be free. From what? Sorry. His longing to be free from... His longing to be free from sin. His longing to be free from the body of sin. We too should be the same. We should long to see brothers and sisters walk closer to Christ. Praying for one another. We should long to see the lost as with this adulterous woman. Come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And not do it in such a condemning way. But do it in a way to where it aches us and we long to see redemption in their lives. Because remember, remember we often have to be reminded, do we not? We often have to be reminded in a passage of scripture 
in first first Corinthians chapter six verse eleven. Remember first Corinthians chapter six verse eleven. For so too were you. For so too were you, the adulterer, the homosexual, the murderer, the thief. Deep down into the inner part of your soul, of your being, so too were you, so ravaged in sin. Until it was Christ, as Justin said this morning at the beginning. Until it was Christ that come along and took you and cleaned you. You done nothing in that. You had nothing to do. The only thing you had to do in that is the act itself. The sinful act itself. It was, it was Christ that come along. You too were, were like the drunkard, the greedy people, the thieves, the abusive people, those who worshipped idols, those who committed sexual sins. You too were the, the lowest of the low. Also some of you to the Corinthians were just like that. But now you're cleansed. You're made holy. You're made right with God by the calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. You notice how Paul adds by the Spirit of our God. The calling was only made possible because the Spirit of the Lord God gives you the ability, does He not, to call out for forgiveness and for salvation through Christ. Paul says, remember, you brought nothing to this table of salvation but your own sinful wretchedness. That's all you brought. You brought a bag of sin too heavy to carry. It's Christ that redeemed you. It's Christ that gave you redemption. It's Christ that did these things. Back to John chapter 8 and verse 11. She said, No man, Lord, no man is here. Jesus said unto her, Neither will I condemn you, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You see, the one that was standing there, the one who could have threw the stone, the one who could have threw the stone, says, Go and sin no more. A great act of forgiveness was demonstrated here in John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. A great act of forgiveness demonstrated by the forgiver of the world. Listen, you and I understand as believers, I hope you understand the Romans chapter 7 struggle. The struggle of a believer with sin. May too, we have a forgiving heart towards one another. We're called to live holy lives. We're called to be separate. We're called to be holy. We're called to keep from slipping back into our own ways, our old ways. We're called to do these things. 
We're called to prepare ourselves to, to fight against these things. We're called to remember that our redemption comes through Christ and Christ alone. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, it says this, So prepare your minds for action. Exercise self-control. Put all your hope into gracious salvation that will come to you when Christ Jesus is revealed in the world. You must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. The woman, the adulterous woman that was drugged before the crowd in John chapter 8, she didn't know any better then, but now she does. Now she must be holy in everything she does. Everything you do be holy, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scripture says, you must be holy because I am holy. You must be holy for I am holy. She knew no better, but now she does. Now she does. The mark that this scene left to the crowd standing around and standing around Jesus as he taught that day probably never left their minds because they just witnessed the greatest act of forgiveness that ever could be witnessed, could ever could be seen as he witnessed Christ as they witness Christ, Jesus, forgive an adulterous woman that was drugged before them to be condemned. But Christ turns and says, Go. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So as we close this morning, listen. You too. You too. Me too. I too. If you're here this morning and if you know Christ as your Redeemer, you understand what it is to be condemned no more. You're not under condemnation. <laughs> but if you're here this morning and you have never called upon Him for redemption in your life, according to what we've just seen in John or just read just quickly in John chapter 3, then you are condemned for your unbelief, for your refusal to believe. Amen. Until you come to faith in this light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the Redeemer of fallen mankind, until you come to them, and only them. The Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, doesn't take pleasure in man going to hell. His holiness demands it. It demands it. May we take this story of forgiveness and redemption out to this lost and dying world and tell those around us that it's Christ and Christ alone that offers forgiveness. And we, when we are approached in our lives with a believer who's fallen into some sin, may we have compassion on them. Longing to see them not stay in that sin, but to be freed from that sin. We know the consequences that it brings. Let's pray. Our Father, Lord, we, we love you and we thank you so much for all that you've done. Doing for us in our lives with this church. Lord, to you goes the glory and the honor and the praise. We thank you for your word this morning. 
it's truthfulness, it's penetrating, it's clear. May you be glorified, may you be honored. May we see your forgiveness in this passage of Scripture in John chapter 8. Your compassion, your forgiveness on this adulterous woman. We see your compassion and forgiveness in our own lives. And may we go out into this world and there's nothing of you and may, they, may we tell them of you, about you, and what time we have left. We ask of you, Lord, to answer our prayers that we offered up this morning, our requests. And bring us back this evening for fellowship at Pizza Plus, and it's, maybe we just have a time of fellowship. Time to talk to one another and enjoy each other's company. For it's in your name we do pray. Amen.